So we host this once a month um, on the second Thursday of every month throughout the year to bring a bunch of people from the town, from the college together to talk about fun, sciencey things, broadly construed. And today I'm super excited to introduce Peter Burke. Peter is a math and computer science major at the college. Uh, and Peter did some research this summer looking at how people engage with discussions about climate change through the comment sections across a variety of uh, newspapers online. Uh, so I'm going to call Peter up here to introduce himself and talk about what he's going to talk about today. So let's give Peter a round of applause. Uh, yeah, so I'm Peter, as many of you know already. Um, like Ali said, I'm a senior here at Millbury College. I, I'm a math slash stat computer science dual major. Um, I run track and cross country. Um, and yeah, I was interested in this project because I guess just as most people in our age are, we're very interested in issues with climate change, and I also just think the spread of information is very interesting, like the spread of whether it just be conspiracy theories or just normal news, like I just think all of that kind of thing and how these narratives form is very interesting to me. And so I wanted to pursue this project because throughout the news we have like all of these different kinds of headlines and people expressing opinions in different ways. Like you can see the dramatic like Earth and uncharted waters as climate records tumble contrasted with eight years, nine years, six years ago, a climate change activist got to doomsday. So it's really all sides of the coin are shown. And so I was interested to see what people were saying. So there's been a lot of previous surveying work on climate change, which I assume many know already, which basically covers any quantitative question you could ask, like how many people believe in climate change, what the socioeconomic background and various opinions are, um, the age of different things, the party affiliations of different opinions. It really captures anything that you would ever want to know quantitative-wise of who is thinking what about climate change and where those people are coming from and stuff like that. But um, what surveying results kind of fail to capture, which um, we've kind of seen with like, polling in our recent elections a little bit, is like the general narrative that goes along with any issues. And so that's where work like on Twitter and the news has um, become more prevalent. Twitter gets something like over 500 million tweets a day, so it's become a really popular form of media for researchers to look at in order to see kind of like what the public discourse is like and actually get a feel of what the narrative is and what the emotions are more so than just opinions, I guess. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on climate change in Twitter, specifically some of the results I found interesting were determining that people who believed in climate change prefer to climate change or people who didn't prefer to do it in school warming more often. Or, um, deviations from average temperature and like extreme weather events essentially sparked the most climate change conversation that did really change the converse, the composition of the um, So there's just a lot of stuff like that associating the various emotions like climate change believers had fear for climate change, climate change deniers had anger with people talking about climate change essentially. So Twitter really gave a lot of insights into what the overall discourse was really like beyond just what people's opinions were. Um, and then in the news, people, there's been a little bit of work into how climate change is portrayed. You kind of see how, like, what people are actually receiving, which found that um, what was going on domestically really affected what, like, events abroad showed, specifically, like, newspapers. A study in Sweden found that newspapers in Sweden started like, covering wildfires a lot more. Once they had wildfires at home, they started paying more attention to what's happening abroad. And then they also just found that, generally speaking, news, different news sites basically portrayed the same event in different ways and focused on different things. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So that brings me to my three research questions, which is, one, what is the ratio of users expressing climate change belief versus climate change denial in the comment sections of articles pertaining to climate change? And this one, we're going to start off talking about this one, and we're going to talk a lot about I guess the theory of researching this question, because it ends up being a little more tricky than you would expect. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about the various issues that you face when you're trying to use a machine learning approach to tackling this problem. And then from there, we're going to move on to what topics were discussed in comment sections of articles related to climate change, and how did they compare the topics of the articles themselves. So here, we're going to get into some topic modeling, which essentially just summarizes a bunch of text for us and gives it some insight gives us some insight into what it's actually saying without having to read it all, because it's perfectly long to read, uh, but I'll get more into that later. 
And then lastly, how do the sentiments shown in the article as incumbents compare? And does this comparison hold when examining the specific topics? So here we're going to start looking at some of the emotions that people are actually showing when they're directly reacting to the news right there. Um, but so obviously to tackle any of these problems, we're going to need to obtain some data. And so to do that, we went to BBC News and New York Times and basically scraped a bunch of their data. So to obtain a data set, we wrote a bot to scrape all these articles and comments and all the data we wanted, which was the article title, the article text, the comments, the users that were commenting, the date they commented. And um, for those of you that don't know, a bot is essentially just a computer program that crawls through a bunch of websites for us. Um, so we don't have to do it ourselves. Do you have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> well, I should add, but by the way, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions in the middle of, of Pete's talk. Where Happy to encourage that. <laughs> Takes away. So yeah, this bot was essentially just an automated approach to essentially just copying and pasting all this information so we didn't have to sit there at a computer visiting all these links or settings and doing that. And I have a little video here that shows a bot crawling through some comments to show what that actually looks like. You can see it's just scrolling for me and hitting load a bunch of times. So <laughs> I didn't have to spend hours and hours doing that because that would be super tedious and frustrating. And if computers don't mind, he isn't frustrating. The one thing I will note though is I can tell a little bit from this video, it's not the fastest process, so that was one factor in obtaining this data. Like our eventual data set of 136,000 comments from 373 articles took a few days to assemble a burning. Um, thankfully, I was gone for a few days, so I got to do something to do that while I was gone. So that worked out. <laughs> So like I said earlier, with the time component, that was one obstacle to collecting data, but another one was just in generally the HTML structure of websites. So when you want to scrape data, you're essentially looking for the right elements of the website that you want. So a website is built with a bunch of HTML elements. That each, well, in our um, case, we can basically think of it as a bunch of HTML elements that each contain a different um, piece of information, like whether it be a body of text or a picture or something. And so for just scraping like the title or um, article itself, that's pretty easy because that's just like, there's an element that has some ID, you can use that ID to get all the text from the element and that's that piece of information. But for something like comment sections where that's like constantly reloaded as people comment and respond and like and reply and all that kind of thing, that's called dynamic content, and that's a little more hard to access because they're typically loading that through running like another script. Um, and so for BBC News and um, the New York Times, it was okay because they they had it in just like a, a container that we could access essentially. They let um, a bot view it essentially, is how I think about it. But for sites like Fox News and Yahoo News, <coughs> which have some of the more colorful commentary, as you can see in this little example of do your own research and no free ride. Um, they all stored them in a way that bots could not access, um, or at least we weren't able to in a few weeks of banging our heads against the wall trying to, and talking to a software dev professor, he wasn't able to figure out why we couldn't. So it was definitely prohibiting people from seeing what kind of misinformation in general I guess was for on their platforms, which is a little frustrating. But so once we got this data, we started off by just kind of seeing what we had essentially to see. Um, so we started with a, a case study of some of the most active commenters. So when we first looked, we saw that 31 total users had left over 250 comments, which is like almost a comment per article. Um, so these people are very active. Um, and so we're kind of curious about these people that were very active, like what kind of things they were sharing. And so we looked at these two users, Fred, and sorry, I was right. Um, Fred is the most active user on BBC News. And he, looking at just doing a word cloud, kind of like get some preliminary look at what he was talking about, it kind of gave the vibe, I guess, that he was actually focused on climate change, like all the keywords there. 
are things you would associate with a normal discussion of climate change. And then, <coughs> sorry I was right, was an example of a user that maybe had there's some indication that he was <coughs> straying a little off topic with um, the prevalence of words like rubbish and stupid lies and nonsense in China, despite no article being in reference to China whatsoever, um, kind of gave the idea that so maybe some of these active users are also propagating other ideas, not on the like, academic side of climate change. And this was also kind of reinforced by um, when we looked at the sentiment of Sorry I was right's comments, it was slightly negative, essentially just meaning that he was sharing negative emotions in his comments. And I'll get more into later how we calculated that when I get there. But so like I said, the first research problem we were trying to investigate was the ratio of climate change believers versus deniers. So um, everyone should just take a second and read these comments and think about if these people are essentially expressing belief, denial, or neutrality in climate change. So these ones were, to me, at least fairly clear examples. Like, I would say that this first person is um, a little unclear from there comment what they're expressing, so I would classify them as neutral or unclear. And the second one, it, it seems like they're clearly expressing disbelief in climate change, saying more stupid climate hysteria. Then the third one, same kind of thing um, with that second guy. And then the last one, I would say, is expressing belief in climate change. So I guess the point of that was to show that if a human were to read all of these comments, they would be able to assign whether a person was expressing belief or disbelief in climate change. Um, but we don't want to have to do that as a person. Um, it's good to know that it's something that, it's good to be convinced that it's something that you can do, but we want to automate that with the machine because similarly to scraping all this data, that would be super long and tedious for a person to just sit there and read comments all day. And so that brings us into generally this textual analysis of machine learning. Um, because we we're gonna, to automate this, we would have to use a machine learning model basically to read all these comments for us and classify them. And so the, the issue with textual analysis and machine learning is that it's really considered a relatively hard problem, or it's um, a relatively more complex problem at least. Um, and many of the most advanced approaches would use a, a neural network, which is, for those of you who don't know what you think of it as a good learning model, you can teach it to recognize patterns and classify things fairly well in most cases. Um, but the issue with the neural network is, is that it requires a lot of labeled data to train on. Basically the way, the reason it's so good is you, you give it a bunch of data that has like the right answer with it and it learns to recognize like cases where someone's believing in climate change, not believing in climate change, or staying neutral in climate change. And so when we had to strike all this data, there's no label. So we had the issue of supplying enough labeled data to train on. So manually labeling enough data was not going to be a feasible option. As you can see here, um, our, the length of our common data was basically the equivalent of reading the whole Harry Potter series eight times. So <laughs> not really going to be able to, to label enough data to do that. And it would just take too many hours to train a model. And so that was kind of right away not really an option. And so thankfully, though, this issue of labeled data for training is very common in machine learning. And so there are two very common approaches that we could try. One of which is um, finding existing labeled data from similar research that's been published and training a model on that and then applying it to your data or using a pre-trained model that someone used for similar research um, that they published and using that already made model. Um, so in this case, these two approaches both come up short, which is unfortunate. Um, there was no previous research specifically on news comments, um, and so we tried taking published data on Twitter, which, because um, there was numerous data published on Twitter that had this label about climate change that was labeled as believing or not believing or neutral or whatever. And so we tried that. We wrote a model um, a neural network and got it working fairly well in the Twitter data, and then we applied it to our data, and it didn't work at all. Um, you would have been better off just guessing neutral every time than our 
lot of ways. And um, it's not entirely surprising because basically when like a person reads a tweet and then re we reads a comment, like you kind of associate the ideas they're expressing and, and so you would be able to like tell when they're expressing similar things, but when a, a neural network isn't really learning like a person is, it's kind of just learning to associate similar things. And so um, and so when you have a, a tweet versus a comment where the semantic structure is just completely different, um, your network isn't going to be very effective at looking at the, the comment based on the, the tweet because it's it's not going to be able to associate those two things the way it learns. Um, but so there's a third approach that we thought we could try, which um, takes advantage of new AI tools such as ChatGPT, because the whole point about ChatGPT is that it's fairly good at understanding human speech. And um, I mean, it's a chatbot, it can read and understand things to a certain extent. Um, and so we tried doing that, and the answer was that that still wasn't super effective. Um, it was effective when you were using the model on the actual OpenAI website, but OpenAI doesn't want bots spamming their um, spamming their ChatGPT website and basically just giving them all this traffic. So um, they eventually kicked my account off. <laughs> when I tried to do that, um, and so then we had to try to use the API key, which um, just wasn't as good because of the way that the the ChatGPT website is constantly updating. It's just a better model than the, the API. Um, and so the one note on that is that these models are um, evolving really fast, for better or for worse. So um, it's not out of the question to say that not that long in the future this would be a viable way for doing um, an analysis like this. But for us, it was not. And so that kind of concludes our attempt at the believers versus deniers on websites on the website, and those are kind of the issues we face, and that's why we weren't able to, to do that in the end. But so that brings us to modeling the discussion of comments and articles, and so for this, that was, where we would, that was when we were going to be using topic modeling. Um, so topic modeling is essentially just a form of machine learning, unsupervised form of machine learning, meaning you don't have the, the issue with labeled data where you feed in a bunch of text and it looks at that text and it basically associates words that are appearing in similar contexts um, and using that to build these topics, which is centrally just summarizing the text for you and giving you a short version of what the major things people are talking about are. Um, and so you can see here in this example, like if you fed the documents that this text is part of into a topic model, it would be likely to say nuclear fusion are typically co-occurring, and so they're going to be in the topic. Just the way it works, there's a lot of math behind the scenes, which I won't go into, but from a high level, the way it works is it just, you feed a bunch of documents. So for us, that could be like the 300 and whatever articles. And it goes through those and looks for words that are commonly occurring near to each other in those articles. And then if words are appearing next to each other a lot, they associate that together and we'll put them in the topic. And so we ran this on our common and article data from both platforms, and we um, we ended up seeing a lot of similarity in the top topics produced. Um, here on the New York Times, we can see similar on the Canadian wildfires, the southwestern water and energy sources. Um, there's a lot of overlap in what people were talking about to what news was talking about, which makes sense. And the same was seen on the BBC, where um, some of the things people are talking about seem to be in direct response to the articles because there is um, the same major trends appearing. Um, but if you look more closely, there's kind of an asterisk with that in that people weren't actually typically talking about the same thing as the article they were responding to. They were talking about the same um, major things that were followed, but it was oftentimes scattered throughout the website. So, they might respond to an article about wildfires talking about energy, or they might respond to it talking about weather, talking about <laughs> politics or something. Um, so they, they did end up talking about a lot of the same things, but they kind of did it 
in a more scattered way, where they were oftentimes talking about multiple things in the comments, which makes sense because the news is focused on one event, and the comments are just a discussion that follows. And also, one of the other interesting things was that the, the comments were much more focused on China. Um, you can see this is a word cloud, the most common words in New York Times and BBC News comments, and both of them have China as one of their, their biggest words, and it's one of the most common. Um, and in both cases, if you looked at the word cloud of the articles themselves, that wouldn't be the case. China wasn't really talked about at all, but the comments were kind of focusing on that, which was interesting. Um, so this move brings us to sentiment. For doing this sentiment analysis, we're going to be using a method called Valence Aware Dictionary for Sentiment Reasoning, also known as Bader. Um, I think probably some CS nerds really wanted to make it sound like that. It's probably the name of that But so the big benefit of Bader is that similarly to LBA, um, which we used to talk about, it's an unsupervised method, which again just means that we're not going to have this issue with labeled data um, because some of the more advanced methods for doing sentiment analysis would be more neural network approaches, like what we talked about with the gauging the proportion of believers versus deniers. Um, but we were going to run into the same problems with that here as we did there. Um, so we started with Vader, which is a, a lexicon-based approach, meaning it essentially takes word scores um, in order to judge the sentiment of like a body of text. Um, but it, it's based off of a library they developed by employing a bunch of human readers. So it does a little better than most lexicon-based uh, methods do and uses some heuristics to try to, to catch the long-term dependencies in text, which is helpful. So it's it's pretty good at judging things that are stated clearly, like this example down here where it says climate change is a disaster. These are all the major word scores below. And so it would say that that's a, a negative sentiment in that sentence. But what it falls short on is if someone um, is like speaking with sarcasm or if they're using an emoji to express um, emotion, it does not capture that. So that's kind of its main shortcoming. So I was curious then, does it capture like anything else like scare quotes too? Because I noticed on your example you had a lot with like scare quotes around things. Like Oh, like when you quote something like if you call someone a denier, you know, chances are you have something else. I'm pretty sure it drops punctuation, so I don't think it does. Um, it does though. Look at diagrams, I believe, to capture when people say like not something for indications and also for um, NT contractions. So it, it does that to get. Um, it was kind of things that a lot of these types of methods would miss out on. And so looking at the sentiment on New York Times articles and the comments, uh, we see that they were generally centered around zero, um, and they generally had a positive skew, both of them. Similarly, it looks, just looking at these histograms that show basically the score of each article and body of comments, it seems that the the articles are showing a little less emotion, they're a little more tightly clustered around zero, which is confirmed when you look at it. You can see that comments express the sentiment with a greater magnitude over 62% of the time. So it's either they express the same sentiment, like either both positive or both negative, and the comment was bigger, or different opposite sentiment, and the comment was bigger. Um, but they did express the same sentiment most of the time, almost 72% of the time. And so it seemed like from this, it seemed like people commenting on the New York Times were reflecting the same general emotion and just um, kind of magnifying that a little bit. And so then we were wondering if these things held across all of our topics. Um, and so they more or less did. Um, we can see that every topic in both the comments and the articles had an overall positive sentiment score. Um, but this is not uniform. Um, like for the articles, the most, most positive was associated with world emissions and Canadian wildfires, and the least positive was with politics and electric vehicles and energy. 
and with the comments the most positive sentiment was associated with humans and technology and the least positive was associated with electricity. So you can see some overlap in that both of them associated energy to be their quite most their least positive. Um, but generally the, the trends we saw in the last slide held across each individual topic. And so for BBC News, we actually saw um, so the different trends in that the articles actually expressed sentiment of a greater magnitude, 83% of the time. And so most of the time, the articles were showing more emotion than the comments were. And we actually, we looked at the, the general scores of individual comments and individual article sentences to see if it was just like extreme comments on the positive and negative end canceling each other out. But that um, wasn't the case and we visualized that. It was actually just that the, um, the articles were showing more emotion, which I thought was interesting. And then similarly, in the New York Times, they were expressing the same sentiment. Um, on track. Um, so then we again went to see if these trends were seen across all um, topics individually. And um, it was slightly less so than with the New York Times. We've seen the, the common sentiment scores, both the topic on science and the topic on just like the state of the environment and had slightly negative sentiments. Um, the only topics that had that. Um, but otherwise, everything was relatively uniform, relatively similar to what we'd seen with the New York Times, which I thought was interesting. Um, so that leads us to our eventual conclusions that um, our topics generally stayed, our comments generally stayed on the topic of climate change, like other than specific users' deviations, like the overall discussion was very much what you would expect or hope people would be talking about after reading articles about climate change. Um, but there's no way to say that that would be true if we'd been able to access the comments of more news sites like either Yahoo News or Fox News where the little tidbits that I read when I was trying to um, figure out how to scrape that suggested that that was not going to be the case as, the, as we saw in some of the examples earlier, the comments did not seem like they were very on topic or interested in what the story had been talking about. Um, so I guess that would have been my, my biggest way I would have wanted to extend this project, which is having more new sources to see how, I think more of the interesting trends would have been seeing on these more like, colorful, I guess, like divisive um, news sites than what we had with BBC News and New York Times, which have relatively similar reader bases and also relatively similar reader bases to So for the EC, they just didn't have a very good public archive. And so we just went back to everything they had stored on their website, and there's all the articles that they had comments from. And then for the New York Times, we went back, I'm trying to remember how many years, it was like five years or something worth. And um, we could have gone back further, but I didn't really want we already had about twice as many comments from New York Times as BBC News, and I didn't really want it to be too lopsided for comparison. Uh, you showed us like two examples of users who were some of the highest, like most active on, in the comment section. Did you find when you looked at you know the greater range that there was a trend for like the most the people who were the most active to be on topic or off topic or like sort of straying away from what the article was talking about? It seemed like it kind of followed the, um, like it was kind of following the same trend that we saw with everything else in the little case study yeah. did. Gotcha. Hey, um, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering, did you take a look at some of these um, positively valenced comments to sort of see like why this positive sentiment skew? Like, is that what you would expect? Like, what's going on there? Um, it seemed like a lot of them were just on promoting, like, 
change for the better in policy. It was just like people expressing <coughs> enthusiasm on the good from what, what I saw, but I will admit I didn't look at a, a huge body of that. Cool. Thing. So when you were looking at the comments, were there ever some articles that had like a really large amount of comments? And how did you like account for people got in like comment arguments? It was, did you just choose every single comment that was on the article or did you filter any of that? Yeah, we just loaded all of the comments from all of the articles. So on the BBC News, they all had a lot of comments on the New York Times versus some articles only had like a few. Um, but I think your comment about people like getting in arguments or whatever um, was one of the issues that trying to look into the like, believers versus deniers or like promoting belief versus promoting disbelief question is difficult is because when you're looking at a comment thread, kind of the, the context of what they're responding to, um, that we didn't have a good way to capture that. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm like pretty active on Twitter and understand a lot of the, the sentiments that, that are in the comment sections on Twitter. I was wondering, you said you, you looked at some previous studies to try and figure out like uh, if you could use one of the models that was trained on Twitter and like did you see um, a lot of the same results uh, in the, the Twitter models as you kind of saw in your own research or? Um, I'm trying to think back to the, the Twitter models. I think for the topic modeling, yes. I would have to go back and look for this sentiment. Or I don't remember, sorry. Um, I know when like scraping data from Twitter, one of like the big problems you encounter is like bots, like scraping tweets that are like obviously from a bot. Is that something you encountered at all when like looking at comments on articles? Well, that was why we first looked at our data to look for the most active commenters. Um, like no one was commenting out of the realm of like what you'd expect a person to essentially. Um, so I guess that's a, a pretty limited bot check, but we just looked to make sure there was no like one bot user that was going to be driving results, which we did not see. Yeah, uh, from my experience on the internet, I found that like people who are more in the minority are more committed or vocal about their views, and like, maybe that here to make that scheme you described smaller, or seem smaller than it actually is. That's true, and how do you account for that? Um, well, I don't think that I wouldn't try to argue that these results are um, representative of like the general population or even the, the whole like reader base. I think it's more just interesting to see that like these are accessible. If you scroll at the bottom of the article, you're going to see these comments. So I was more just interested in what the narrative that was spreading on these were that were um, essentially like being spread to all these people. So I wasn't too worried about people being more vocal or less vocal because that was, I guess, part of what I was interested in. Uh, I was wondering if you know anything about the moderation policies of these two news outlets and what impact that might have on the data So they all, um, they take down comments with profanity, which you would imagine could eliminate some that would have a negative sentiment. Um, and they all claim to be aware of, quote, like harmful or misinformation. Um, looking at the examples from Fox News or Yahoo News, it didn't seem like there was any moderation. Um, and then looking at, um, New York Times and BBC News, it's hard to say how much they actually moderated. They had that same policy. Um, it's hard to say if they're better about enforcing that. Or... Thanks. Uh, I just had a question about how you were uh, like giving the scores on, or how you got scores for this event. Uh, you, you like saw examples of ones that were neutral and negative, but since we had some, or since you had so many that were, you know, positive sentiment, like what are some words or terms that like, do you have any example of what would produce a positive score? 
Um, well, I mean, some of the comments on an article about nuclear fusion, which had the, the highest sentiment on any of the topics, there's just a lot of like, a lot of the comments were like, this could like save, but like that kind of okay. thing. Yeah, yeah. The same thing with like a lot of um, stuff about electric vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you one more time.